Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today with an old friend uh, and a staunch environmental advocate, Eleanor Bravo, who is the field director of Food and Water Watch New Mexico. Excuse me. Uh, she is really a tireless advocate for uh, the public good. Uh, and uh, she belongs to an organization which is opposed to what they call the financialization of nature, something that uh, I am also opposed to. Now it has become the first national organization to propose an actual ban on fracking and has just produced a massive document which, which details the reasons why it has taken that position. It's a position that the Mercury has also taken over the years now. Uh, it's really wonderful to have you here with us, Eleanor, and uh, we look forward to a really good conversation today. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be back. Thank you. So we need to get some baselines here. One, we need to know who does really fund uh, Food and Water Watch, and I'd love it if you could also, in almost the same breath, describe a little bit about, for all of our readers, actually in detail, what fracking actually is, how it is permeated the uh, the gas and oil exploration world, um, and then we'll get into some more of the details. So Food and Water Watch is a nonprofit, a 501c3, and we are a consumer advocacy organization, and we take no government and no corporate money. We are funded by individuals. We do have some foundation money, but primarily we have donors and supporters and people who feel it's so important to do what we're doing. So fracking, it's, it's, it's probably our major issue because it affects all aspects of food and water. Now fracking is a horizontal drilling technique which has been used for quite some time but it got extremely dangerous around 2000, 2005 when it began using some very toxic chemicals in the fluid. Now fracking is forcing at high pressure fluid down a borehole that goes horizontally to shock natural gas or oil out of rock formations, generally shale. And we have a tremendous amount of shale here in New Mexico and lots of other places in the country. So it uses a lot of water, a lot of sand, and a huge variety of toxic chemicals. So that's just the kind of basic description of what fracking is. You know, even though we know, <clears throat> or at least, at least some of us uh, uh, believe, and I think it's an accurate belief, that there is a direct causal relationship between the use of fossil fuels and climate change. The climate change is real. We can see it already in our own local weather patterns. And yet, fracking is making billions, if not trillions of dollars for huge numbers of companies all over the world, and particularly in the United States. It seems almost a kind of a quixotic effort, if you will, uh, to try and actually propose a ban on fracking. Um, why, did you, why did your organization decide to do that now? And what do you, th what do you think the long-range prospects are for actually achieving your goal? So you're absolutely correct. Food and Water Watch came out in 2011 for a ban. And we, we have dug in our heels. We do not feel fracking can be done safely. And we also feel that there, the industry has not been able to show us any proof that it can be done safely. So we have actually since 2011 amassed a, a lot of support for this ban. Now, we also support a, a moratorium until proven safe, which is just a different language for a ban. Good. So uh, why do we think that we can do this? First of all, we know it's the right thing to do. We have the science behind us. And now that we have this new report called the urgent case for a ban on fracking, we have now, since 2011, more than 150 new studies in different sectors of the aspect of fracking showing that it is not safe, it is not predictable, and on top of that, we do not want to continue the use of fossil fuels because fracking equals climate change. So we know uh, that, uh, that as your report 
points out in New Mexico, Colorado, I believe, Alabama, Ohio, and Pennsylvania in the last numbers of years, there have been uh, at least at least a thousand incidences, documented incidents of leaking into the groundwater things. Now, of course, the oil and gas industry is adamant about this. Is never there's never been a proven case of contamination of groundwater or anything even remotely like that. But how can they possibly s say that? This involves plumbing. It involves man-made devices that always are flawed because we are a flawed species. <laughs> it's it just seems to me to be just a bald face lie to say that. So could you could you give us a little taste of of some of these studies and what they show us and things? So the oil and gas industry is basically a self-regulated industry. Right. They are, are not subject to much inspection. They inspect themselves and they report what they feel is reportable. So let's just talk about New Mexico in particular. Okay. We have had a number of incidences of groundwater uh, pollution and stream pollution. Now, th these have been kept fairly quiet. For one thing, the oil fields are not near Albuquerque, Santa Fe, these areas. They are sequestered in more remote areas. So we don't hear about them. Now the oil and gas industry also has a billion dollar lobby. So they're able to keep things quiet. And it is, you're absolutely right, it's a bold-faced lie. There have been serious pollution incidences. Many of these incidences have been brought to suit and have come to court and are under gag order. So People have lost their homes. They have had the demise of their livestock. And they have received money from some of the oil and gas industries, but they're not allowed to talk about it. And so that's basically why it, nobody seems to feel the gravity of the situation. It's not in the media. Well, a recent piece um, um, in the Mercury we called uh, natural gas uh, gained by fracking a bridge to nowhere uh, because the logical inconsistency of the PR argument from the oil and gas industry is that yes this is a bridge to a renewable future but they spend equally amount of, as much money if not more condemning the whole possibility of an alternative fuel future it's the last thing they want when they're all dead and gone maybe they'll be a you know, one lumen of sunlight, you know, somewhere down the road. So, I'm just uh, I'm appalled at the at the lack of honest discussion about it. And I'm really grateful that you guys have done this, because you're a a considerable organization, and uh, you have a lot of power. And you're actually going to try to do something which I am sure most people in the world think is an absolute impossibility. Can you cite some of the studies, um, and then? Discuss, if you could, the possibilities of actually banning fracking in, let's say, New Mexico. And let me just ask one other part to that. Is it possible for the state to fund itself and its educational programs without, not necessarily oil and gas, but without oil and gas achieved by fracking? So we are a grassroots organization, and we have approached... Uh, this issue on the federal level and we continue to approach it in regards to keeping fracking uh, it, it is exempt from the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drink. So we're working on that on the federal level but our, our the majority of our energy now is on the grassroots level. So let's talk about New Mexico. Mora County, uh, one of the first counties in the, the first county in the country to pass a ban on fracking. That ban is in jeopardy. Um, four different municipalities in Colorado also passed different kinds of bans on fracking. Uh, communities in Texas. Now, Texas is the birthplace of fracking. So now you know when uh, Texas is starting to get worried about it, it's it's grave. Yeah. For one thing, here in the Southwest, the conversation about fracking is more about water than anything yes, else. Of course. Fracking takes 
8 million to 30 million gallons of water per frack well. It just depends on the situation. It's a lot of fresh water. It has to be fresh water. So we're in a terrible drought. Now, I know we've had a little bit of rain, but that doesn't replenish our aquifer. No. Texas, of course, was in this huge battle with New Mexico to get water from the Rio Grande. And we don't have the water to give. We made that agreement when we had the water. So we work on the grassroots level. And we are helping other communities in New Mexico, Colorado, and Texas to go further on the, on, in their communities. And it will be a groundswell because th this is about people, Barrett. Yeah. This is about their homes. This is about their children. This is about their livelihood. And the fracking industry is so far-reaching. There is also uh, this whole issue of frack sand mining. Now, the Midwest used to be the only place where you could get this good sand that goes into this slurry that goes into the wells. Now they found uh, areas in the hill country in Texas where they can extract this, this frack sand. It, it, again, uses a tremendous amount of water and puts a lot of silica into the air. So, if indeed climate change is real, as I know it is, and you do too, and if the use of fossil fuels, including natural gas, is, has a causative relationship to climate change. This is a serious, serious issue. Almost, it's almost as if the term fracking, which is, it used to be a wonderful term, but it's sort of almost kind of, I don't know, minimizes the the actual reality of what's happening here. We see our climate changing all the time. Anyway, what I want to do now is is that is I know as I've been reading this wonderful document, I've seen numerous uh, case studies and other kinds of studies, and I'd like you to reflect on those a little bit for us. So yes, we do have now more than 150 studies since 2011, and they address this issue of fracking in a variety of ways. Uh, one in particular is, are the social costs of fracking. Oh, right. So these oil rigs move into town, um, brings in a, a transient population. There's more crime. Right. There's more sexually transmitted diseases. Right. So we have seen this. It's documented uh, in the Midwest and uh, Pennsylvania other, and other areas of mm -hmm. the country and in New Mexico. So that's the social aspect of fracking. Now, the environmental aspect and the public health aspect are also addressed in many of these studies, and primarily birth defects, oh dear. documented birth. If you live within even 10 or more miles from a frack well site, you're subject, you're, you want a healthy baby, you better move out. We know that now. People are getting respiratory, getting uh, terrible headaches. These chemicals are endocrine disruptors. They're in the water, they're in the air. The incidences of, of these maladies among the people who live in these areas, now we have documented, is so much greater. Another aspect of, of some of the studies, earthquakes. Yes. So what do you do with all this? So, so you, you've put all this water down this, this borehole. Some of it comes up. It comes up with that slurry of chemicals, but it also brings up hydrocarbons, whatever was down there, and they come to the surface. They're toxic. So wh whoever lives in that area is going to suffer. And so what do you do with this water? Well, they're injecting it into high-pressure wells to get rid of it because it can never be treated in a municipal uh, water system. It can never become water again. It is in environmentally and ecologically not water. So now it's being injected into what we call injection wells in informally seismically quiet areas we have earthquakes documented now Many. Many. it's not a mystery why we have more earthquakes now all of a sudden we have more earthquakes it's due to these injection wells those are just a few of the things that are have been addressed in these new studies so just to get an overall picture how many 
fracking wells are there, and is there really a meaningful distinction between regular wells and fracking wells? And if you put them all together, what's the, what's the number? So in New Mexico alone, uh, we have about 100,000 wells. And 90% of them are fracked at some time or another. Now, the industry doesn't have to report which are fracked and which aren't. So this is an approximation. So it's a lot. It's a lot of wells. But we must know that in New Mexico, and it's different in every state, we get a lot of money for education from the oil and gas industry. But the problem there is we are drilling twice as many wells and getting half as much oil or gas. So it's going away. So, and I think, you know, you understand that fracking is, is getting the dregs. It's getting the last bits. It's the last bits. And so the distinction between a, a fracked well and non-fracked well, m mostly the process now is fracking. The conventional wells is one borehole. Fracking is a borehole with horizontal uh, uh, drilling going in, in the horizontal direction. So that's the major distinction between just a, a conventional drilling technique and the fracking technique. So, so you, here we are, our education system is largely dependent on the oil and gas industry. And the oil and gas industry is also diminishing the amount of tourism because it's horrible, it's ugly, it destroys our pristine, beautiful communities. So it is damaging our economy in many ways. It's damaging our air, our water, and our one of our greater industries, which is tourism. So the challenge here and in many other communities is finding an alternative revenue stream. And here in New Mexico, we need to do this right away. Right. So. Um I've been hearing a little bit about liquefied natural gas and the exportation of it, and that it might indeed play a role in re revenue production uh, in New Mexico. What is it? How is it gained? What uh, is there an actual mining process to make it, or is it a, a production process? So when natural gas is extracted, it can be liquefied, and this is how okay. it is transported, and that also is another issue because they transport it now by rail. And here in Lamy, we have a transfer station and the amount of accidents that has happened by rail is great. It has become another huge issue in this country in regards to fracking. So previously, our ports, I think Corpus Christi and in the Northwest, a part of the United States, have been to import gas. And so a huge amount of resources are being spent to, tr to transform these, these ports into export. And <clears throat> we're not going to lower our gas prices by doing more fracking. We're going to sell this to China and Japan. Japan has a huge need for energy right now, and so does China. These are huge markets. So who's going to benefit from these extractive industries? Not New Mexicans. Not New Mexicans. Not Texans. Not, not Coloradans. The oil companies. They will pocket this revenue. So what should we do in our economy? We need our lawmakers to get really smart. We need to start incorporating programs in our communities which we can wean ourselves away from this dependence on this s small amount of jobs that the natural gas industry and the, and the oil and gas industry say they have provided. We need to start building up tourism, alternative methods of farming, and increase our production of our most precious plant, the chili industry, we need to be spending our resources finding an alternative revenue because natural gas and fossil fuels, they're going away and they contribute to our carbon footprint and they contribute to the destruction of our environment. So I'd love you to reflect a little bit about the, the subsidization of the 
of the oil and gas industry. But before we get to that, is alternative energy, solar and wind energy, a viable economic option to oil and gas? Will it be able to generate, in your judgment, enough money to do what oil and gas does for education in New Mexico? So I, I, don't, I don't want to, people to think that solar and wind can just come in and take the place of oil and gas. The oil and gas industry is hugely subsidized. And the more money, resources we put into that, it delays our transition to, oil, to renewables. Right. Now, we have sun and wind. But we don't have the infrastructure yet to transport that kind of energy. And that is where we need to be spending our attention. Unfortunately, we are still putting resources into promoting more extreme energy extraction. So I think we need to do a number of things. First, we need to stop fracking. We need to stop exempting the method of fracking from the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act. We need to stop subsidizing, subsidizing the oil and gas industry to the tune that we are, which is in the billions. And we need to conserve. We, need, we will need to change some of the things that we do. Now, I'm not saying we should not have the wonderful lives that we all have. But there are other countries in the world, particularly Germany, uh, who, who have mostly renewables at this point. Now, they have a, one of the strongest economies in the world, and so could the United States. So it's, it's multifaceted. Uh, so we're not just going to unplug oil and gas and, uh, and fill it in with solar and wind. But we do need to build up the infrastructure for these new and different kinds of energies change the way we use energy in our homes and on our highways and in our lives. We need to, to change our way of thinking. I completely agree with you, of course. The, the, um, the irony of spending money on an industry that is slowly killing you off is almost too much to bear after a while. Um, so let me ask you what your short-term and long-term projections are for this particular campaign. Um, are you looking for many more grassroots efforts, many more towns and counties in the West to do this? And are you looking for eventually in the long term perhaps whole, whole states to ban? We are being aggressive about working grassroots. And it is, is the, at the request of many local municipalities in different states. I particularly work in the Southwest, and we continue to assist communities in New Mexico, and now I am working much more in Texas. You may have heard that the city of Denton, where there's a tremendous amount of fracking, and they can show that the people of Denton are not benefiting from this industry, that that money's just going out, and their quality of life because their air and water has been so damaged. There are other cities in Texas now that want to address this situation city by city. We were very successful last year in the city of Dallas where there is no fracking. Yeah. And we helped, we helped them. They were very active. And uh, we helped them pass a, a zoning ordinance, which really works in a city. Now, it prohibited any drilling within 1,500 feet of any place of work, any residence, any watershed, which is basically nowhere. Yeah. Now, you know Dallas and Fort Worth are pretty pretty, pretty much close. close. In Fort Worth, they're fracking in the schoolyards. So wow. we, this was a, a great success, and we ju just will go on from there. And yes, we will work continuously on the grassroots level and the federal level. We, we had tried to pass a ban on fracking here in New Mexico last year, um, introduced by uh, wonderful Senator Souls down from the southern part of the state. And we will continue in other states to try to bring this to the state level, and we will continue on the federal level. My feeling is that 
at some point, and hopefully soon, it will reach a tipping point. Because we have heard, now, you know, there's different different schools of thought here. Some people say we have maybe 10 or 20 years before we're looking at the major destruction of some of our most basic resources, our water and our air. And there isn't, that isn't much time. So this is a critical, critical issue. And fracking of this magnitude and with these poisonous chemicals promises to be one of the most destructive processes that we have seen in the history of our country. So it's always been a curiosity to me that that the chemicals used in fracking have been have been um, protected proprietarily. Um, uh, the companies don't have to tell us what's in them, and so we can't prepare for what might be in them. And uh, but they always say, "Oh, don't worry, uh, it's completely non-dangerous." What happens? What do you think um, is the realistic projection of fracking actually going away on its own? They seem to say they have. 70, 80, 90, 100 years left. Is that an accurate uh, no. assessment? So the oil and gas industry has claimed that we have hundreds of years of fossil fuels. It, to us, it, it doesn't matter. We cannot afford to burn any more fossil fuels right. because it contributes to climate change. So it, that is not even a question that we want to entertain. So in regards to the, this frac fluid, there are many organizations working for what's called disclosure. Tell us what's in it. We support disclosure. However, we basically already know what's in it. We already know it's poisonous. We already know it's carcinogenic. And now we know that this frac fluid that comes up is radioactive. This is something we didn't really know three years ago. Hmm. So that is something that we found out recently. So we're dealing now with a much, much more grave situation. So we have found that out because we've had people in the field collect some of this fluid. Uh -huh. and, and we've had it analyzed and we found out that it contains so many more dangerous things than we originally thought. Did you get any backlash from the companies when uh, uh, when you did that? So we're not popular with the oil and gas industry, <laughs> you, might, you might say. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of allies. And so we work with a lot of other organizations that uh, that have a lot of resources, and we do share a lot of, uh, uh, of this information. So it's not exactly me going out with a, a scoop. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. But it is documented. Yeah. Uh, Heavily documented, so so we know how dangerous this is at this point. Right. It seems sort of silly to have to try and do this over and over again, but this issue is so real to me and is so vital and is so immediate, and yet it is so submerged in the public consciousness, it is so submerged in the media, the media doesn't even talk about it. I mean, there's to actually make an equation between fossil fuels and climate change in a world in which climate change is denied, the causal relationship between fossil fuels and climate change is denied, it seems like uh, like you're really having a heck of a battle here, and uh, and even to get this issue up to the surface in in the public attention is is a real uphill battle, uh, a real struggle. So, what are your long range strategies, and what are your basic recommendations for immediate actions. So on the short term, we would ask the general public to get educated about this. And we have an annual event, which is called the Global Frackdown. And actually, it's going to be this year, October 11th. And communities all over the world will be having all kinds of events, films, uh, teach-ins, speakers, rallies, protests, all over the world on the same day. And we do this with lots of other allies, and we have many more allies now than we had before who recognize that fracking is, is a dangerous process. So uh, we will continue to do a lot of information, dissemination, 
in education with the general public and with the help of the public health organizations because we, we now know that this is a terrible threat to public health and our lawmakers. We are winning over very responsible lawmakers little by little and this is what we hope will continue. And we are going after lawmakers who have aspirations for greater roles in this country, particularly Governor Cuomo, who would, is looking at the White House, and we would like him to know that the road to the White House is not lined with frack wells. So we are holding our elected officials accountable for what they do, where they get their money, and how well they are going to steward their constituents and this world and our natural resources. So in the long run, then, um, what we're looking at is a combination of things. We're looking at a, at a large grassroots effort, uh, probably all, all across the country, and the more that happens, the better we are. We're looking for a global liaisoning with all kinds of other activities and other groups and nations that are working on this issue. Uh, in, um, in New Mexico, uh, October 11th, is it going to have a, are we going to have a, a celebration and an act and a, uh, a rally around this issue too? And where will it be and how do we get in contact about it? So in New Mexico, we are having a global frack down event in Albuquerque uh, at the Peace and Justice Center yeah. from 4 to 6, and we will have an, a number of different organizations come in and do presentations. Uh, we have wonderful allies here, Environment America and our, uh, our affiliate here, Environment New Mexico, the Sierra Club, and uh, they will come and they will each give a presentation on their aspect of working with uh, fracking as, as one of their issues. We will also show parts of Gasland, which is Josh Fox's, uh, he has two now, Gasland 1, Gasland 2. So we will have a lot of information and um, a lot of people that, that can talk about this issue of fracking. And uh, there, I believe there will be another, a couple of other uh, events throughout the state and in as well in Texas, Denton, Dallas, San Antonio. Um, and please go on our website, foodandwaterwatch.org, and they should all be listed there. So that's October 11th, not very far away. Thank you so much for being here, Eleanor. It was, this is a, I'm very excited that this is happening, that there actually is an organization with such clout as yours that's really, really talking about this in a serious, meaningful way. Uh, it's heartening, and, and uh, many of us are very grateful, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you bringing this to the public eye, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be here.